Hi there and welcome to learn A-level biology for free with Miss Estrick. In this video I'm going to be showing you how the statistic chi-squared can be applied to inheritance questions. If you're new here then just click subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the latest videos. So just to recap first of all about the statistic chi-squared, it's one of the three that you need to know for A-level biology. And the reason you would use this, or the circumstances, would be if you're investigating whether there's a difference between frequency data. And that's going to be the key here, differences between frequency. Now, if you're not confident on chi-squared, I'll link my first video on chi-squared, which goes through all the details you need to know. In this video, I'm just going to be showing you how it can be applied to inheritance questions. And in this first example, I'm going to link it to a question to do with the disease cystic fibrosis, which is caused by a recessive allele. And in this example, I've got um, two parents who are both carriers, and we want to know what's the probability that those two parents will have a girl with cystic fibrosis. Now, if they're both carriers, the genotype would be heterozygous, which we can see here. I've done the Punnett square, and we can see that we have um, one quarter would have cystic fibrosis, but they also want to know what's the probability that it will be a girl with cystic fibrosis. So that's why the next step is I've multiplied by 50% um, and our overall probability is 12.5% using a Punnett square. Now the way you can use chi-squared is to investigate whether what you expect is going to be significantly different to what we actually observe because using Punnett squares, it's all probabilities and saying this is what I expect to happen. It's not based on observation. So that is how we use chi-squared in inheritance. First of all, you would use your Punnett square to work out what is the frequency that you expect to see. Then you'll have to record what you actually observe. And then we can do the statistic to see, is there a significant difference between what we expected and what we observed. So I'm going to go through a whole example with you and this is the example that I always do each year with students at my school um, and it's using ear of corn and in the UK you're probably not familiar with seeing corn on the cob like this because at supermarkets we just get it as yellow corn but in reality there's lots of different variations which is determined by their alleles and you can get corn which is purple yellow, smooth, wrinkly in texture. So it's quite a good one because you can clearly observe the different phenotypes um, quite quickly. So we're going to go through an example and that is looking at does the frequency of purple and yellow corn match what the Mendelian genetics probability states we would expect. So first step is we need to do our Punnett square to have a look at what is the frequency that we would expect. So purple is the dominant allele, yellow is recessive. And in this exam question, in this example, we're stating that there were two heterozygous parents that were crossed. And here's the Punnett square. So the result is we have 75% of the offspring we would expect to be purple and 25% we would expect to be yellow. So the expected ratio is three to one. The next step is, that is our expected, uh, but we need to see what is the actual. And to do this, you need to then count all of the purple and all of the yellow on your ear of corn. So in this example, the student then counted and there were 21 purple kernels and 13 yellow kernels. So we then need to use chi-squared to see does this follow the expected ratio and therefore Mendelian genetics? So the next step is a null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis in this case is there is no significant difference between the expected and the observed frequency of the colour of corn kernels. So we're saying that the expected of three to one um, is going to be exactly the same as what we observe, a three to one ratio overall. 
Now you don't actually have to be able to calculate chi-squared for the exam. You would just be given the chi-squared value or the p-value to come to a conclusion. But I'm just going to show you how you would do this because some of you might be asked to do this as an experiment in lessons and you've got this to help. So as I said, the observed frequency was 21 purple, 13 yellow. So that means in total we have 34 corn kernels. The expected ratio was 3 to 1, but we need to turn that into a frequency. So 3 out of 4 will be purple, but we actually have 34 um, corn kernels. So we needed to do 75% of 34, which is 25.5, and then 25% of 34, which is 8.5. So we now have our observed frequency and our expected frequency. We can then do the stages of chi-squared. So I've implemented these results already. So observed minus expected, that is then squared, divided by the expected value, and then the sum of that column is 3.176. So that is our chi-squared value. So in an exam, you'd be given that value. You wouldn't have to do this table here. So we've now got our chi-squared value. The degrees of freedom is one, and that is because it's the number of categories minus one, so n minus one. And we have two categories, purple and yellow. Minus one, we only have one degree of freedom. So we then need to see what our critical value is. And to do this, we need to look at the one degree of freedom row, and we always look at 0.05, which is 5% probability that the difference is due to chance for our p-value, because that means you can be 95% confident that the difference is significant. So the critical value that we are using is 3.841. And we have to compare that to our chi-squared value. So the calculated value of chi-squared, we said, was 3.176, and that is less than the critical value of 3.841 at the p-value of 0.05. So that means at this value, we know there would be 5% probability it's due to chance. Now, because our chi-squared value does not exceed that threshold, that critical value, that means there's actually more than 5% probability that the results are due to chance. And in this case, what we mean by results is the difference between the expected and the observed frequency. So we have to accept the null hypothesis, which we stated up here in green. And because we're accepting that, what that means is there is no significant difference between what we observed and what we expected. So if we then finally link that back to the Mendelian genetics and say what that means, it means that the corn kernels that we observed did follow the expected ratio of 3 to 1, and therefore it did follow Mendelian genetics. So we've managed to use chi-squared to say that there is a significant um, match between what we expected using our Punnett square and what we actually used. And in that way, we've used the statistic to prove Mendelian genetics. So that is it for using chi-squared in inheritance. Hope you found it helpful. If you have, give it a thumbs up.